these times. Hello and welcome to India's EV mission. In a bid to increase India's electric vehicle adoption, the central government has extended the fame of fast adoption and manufacturing of electric vehicle scheme by two years. Along with that, at least 18 states have their own electric vehicle policies. Let's look at things on the ground. Yes, the fame scheme, which was set to expire in March 2022, that has been extended by a two-year period. That's right, but no additional allocation. The existing outlay of 10,000 crores will continue till 2024. And this is because only 0.5% of this uh, 10,000 crore allocation has been used so far. So what does the FAME scheme do now? Well, it increases the two-wheeler subsidy significantly from 10,000 rupees per kilowatt hour currently to 15,000 rupees per kilowatt hour. EESL will be procuring 3 lakh electric three-wheelers. They will also be procuring 4,500 buses specifically for nine cities. But uh, it seems that state governments are really driving India's electric vehicle policy. Look at New Delhi, look at Madhya Pradesh, UP, Meghalaya, Odisha, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Kerala, Karnataka. They've all rolled out electric vehicle policies and their own subsidies for electric vehicles as well. Gujarat is the latest state to join that bandwagon and uh, they have rolled out a subsidy of up to 20,000 rupees on two wheelers, 50,000 on three wheelers and 1.5 lakh on electric four wheelers as well. Gujarat is also giving a 25% capital subsidy on charging stations. They're targeting 528 charging stations in Gujarat over the next few years. Maharashtra is also revising its electric vehicle policy. In fact, the revised draft, we're told, could be approved by the state cabinet as early as this week. And they are targeting 10% electric vehicles by 2025 and 10% electric buses in their fleet in the next two to three years. They will be putting specific focus on five cities, including Mumbai, Pune, Nagpur, Nasik and Aurangabad as well. Let's uh, also look at... Uh, the major roadblocks to EV adoption right now. Well, electric vehicles are barely 1.3% of the total vehicles on the roads. If you look at FY21 numbers, uh, there were around uh, 2.3 lakh electric vehicles that were sold compared to 1.86 crore IC engine vehicles as well. Charging infrastructure, that is a big drawback as well. Currently, you have around 1,800 charging stations which are serving around 16,000 electric cars across the country. According to a report, India would need at least 4 lakh charging stations for 20 lakh electric vehicles by 2026. Then, uh, accessible financing is another roadblock right now. Few banks offer loans, higher down payments and interest rates for customers who are taking finance for electric vehicles and they have shorter repayment periods as well. But really lots happening on the EV front in India. Tesla is coming to India. Uh, Ola is setting up a big, big mega factory in Tamil Nadu that will have a capacity of uh, 10 million units. You also have Triton EV which has signed up with the Telangana government committing around 2100 uh, crores over there. Let's go across to our guest this evening. We're joined by Pavan Goenka, former MD. Mahindra and Mahindra, also the head of the scale committee. Dr. Goenka, thank you very much for joining us here. We're joined by Arun Kumar, group CFO of Ola, also CFO of Ola Electric. And we're also joined by Sandeep Bangya, who's the head of the EV charging infrastructure at Tata Power. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us on CNBC. Uh, Dr. Goenka, if I can begin with you, do you feel uh, encouraged by these uh, statements coming from the state governments and the central government? The FAME scheme has been uh, extended by two years. Gujarat has come up with its own EV policy. What do you feel? Will this all increase electric vehicle adoption in the country, Dr. Goenka? Right, Chit. Uh, uh, nice to be on this show. And uh, you have very well covered in your opening remarks uh, where we are, uh, what are the constraints, and where we need to go. Uh, let me say that what the government of India has done in the FAME scheme in the last week by extending it uh, by two years, is a step that was almost a must because the payment scheme in the first phase hasn't really taken off um, in terms of providing uh, impetus to more electric vehicles. Uh, what is more encouraging is the fact that more and more states are coming on board and announcing fairly aggressive uh, EV policy. In fact, Gujarat policy uh, is providing benefits almost the uh, same as the central government's payment scheme. Uh, what is uh, disappointing for me, though, Pariksit, is that in spite of all the efforts that have been put in by the government in terms of getting the fiscal incentive 
for electric vehicles. The electric vehicle population is nowhere near what I would have thought uh, we would have by 2021. Uh, of course, uh, COVID has played a role in it, but even that aside, uh, I think we should have been much further ahead than what we are. And uh, I'll be happy to talk about uh, what we need to do uh, later on in the, in the show. Uh, but we really cannot afford to stay at the level that we are. Uh, and uh, as I've said in the past, I'm going to repeat again that the central government and state governments have done enough, uh, are not doing enough. Now it is up to the OEMs, up to the service providers, up to charging infrastructure uh, providers, and up to the consumers uh, to make the electric vehicles transition. And India cannot afford for that transition not to. Right. Absolutely. That's an important point from uh, Dr. Pavan Goenka. We cannot afford to be where you where, be where we are currently. EV penetration is only 1.3% so far. Uh, Arun Kumar, to speak about Ola, uh, the company is creating a lot of excitement in the market. We believe the uh, electric scooter by Ola would be launched in the month of July. Uh, the first phase of the future factory in Tamil Nadu was set to be completed by June. Is that plan on track or has the pandemic delayed things a bit? Yeah, a couple of things. Firstly, uh, I think our plans are absolutely on track. And uh, we are coming up with the world's largest uh, two-wheeler plant. Uh, we called it the Future Factory. And uh, we will launch sometime during July and start deliveries from uh, August. I don't want to give up any more details here. We'll, we'll save the thunder for the pre-launch uh, activity. Uh, having said that, uh, it's very important what uh, Dr. Pavan just mentioned. We are highly thankful to the government for coming up with an ecosystem of uh, incentives. In fact, uh, what you've just talked about is just the fame incentive that goes into the pocket of the customer. In addition, there's a lot of uh, incentive on the charging infrastructure. And not to forget, uh, there are two other uh, incentives as well which the government has rolled out. One is the PLI scheme on exports of electric vehicles, which sort of fits into the OLA strategy of being a global hub. This 10 million mm. vehicles uh, future factory that we are putting up is not just the India demand play, it's a global demand play and is meant to cater to about 10 to 15 mm. percent of uh, global EV demand, which, as you rightly mentioned, about 80 million vehicles mm. are sold globally and less than 1.5% is really electric. And even if you add hybrid, it's uh, less than 10% now, and that's expected to go up to 50% by 2030. So that's PLI and auto, which is encouraging. And the last thing I want to uh, point I want to make is that uh, the government is also mm. combining, uh, I would say a heady concoction and a very positive for our economy of uh, technology and mobility, which is why it's come up with uh, another PLI scheme for advanced cell chemistry. Because as you know, the core or the heart of an electric vehicle is about the battery and inside the battery is the cell. And India produces none of that. It's uh, right. produced globally by a handful of people. And uh, mm -hmm. that demand is expected to go up from uh, 200, 250 gigawatt, that is today, 10 times to about 2.7 uh, mm. billion gigawatt by 2030. And the government has come with a very attractive, up to a 20% subsidy kind of a scheme for advanced cell manufacturing. And uh, mm. thankfully, we are we're probably one of the few players who have the end demand for those cells. Uh, and it's something mm. else that uh, we consider closely as uh, the government rolls it out in the next couple of months. So uh, we are absolutely on track. The first phase will have its 2 million vehicles on the way to 10 million. And a big thanks right. to the government for encouraging the entire ecosystem. Right. And uh, what is uh, what is the kind of rollout you're looking at initially when it comes to manufacturing? You're saying that you will be ready with your factory by the end of June. What are the kind of numbers that you're looking at initially? Yes, we are, we're talking about a launch in July and perhaps delivery starting August. Uh, as I mentioned, the first phase of the plant will have two million uh, vehicles per annum capacity. And... Um, you can count on us that every two quarters we'll probably end up putting an additional line as uh, we see demand pick up. So you should expect us to do uh, upwards of a million vehicles in the launch year as you ramp up and a steady state of two million. But uh, hopefully a couple of years from now, we should be much ahead of those number as uh, we're also launching globally. Uh, in fact, the launch is going to be simultaneous 
uh, Europe, US markets along with India. So it's more or less a global launch. So as volumes pick up, uh, you should see us do a lot more than the 2 million initial capacity that we're setting up. Okay. Uh Mr. Bangia, to come to you, charging infrastructure, very important point, part of the entire EV puzzle. Uh, you're present in about 65 cities. We are picking up that currently there are just about 1,800 charging stations in India. Uh, how much more do we need? How much more charging infrastructure does India need over the next five years or so? And do the current schemes that are coming from state governments and the center really incentivize setting up of charging stations? Hi. First of all, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for getting me onto the show. Uh, well, I think uh, the government has already done a lot, uh, and specifically this particular uh, FAME 2 policy extension. Uh, it augurs very well for the uh, EV ecosystem. Uh, to me, uh, the way I say it is, it has just uh, pulled back the EV transitioning by about two to three years from the way we had expected in the past. Uh, to, but having said that, uh, there is still a lot to be done. Uh, we are right now present in close to 100 cities. 65 is slightly dated. Uh, we, are, we are ramping up very, very fast. That is one. Uh, we have got up to about 500 public charging stations in the country as we talk. And we ex expect to go to about 3,000 in the coming fiscal, uh, which could which could go to, uh, let's say, about 100,000. We are in the, uh, we have publicly announced that about 100,000 by let's say about three, four years uh, from now. Uh, this, uh, as you also mentioned somewhere, that about 400,000 charging stations are required. Uh, but the number of charging stations obviously will in a some way com commensurate with the vehicles coming in. And this is where I think the policy uh, changes that are happening uh, will really make a lot of difference. Uh, there are a lot of fiscal incentives in involved in this uh, policies. And these states are also adding up their own share of the fiscal incentives. Over and above that, I think we also need a lot of non-fiscal incentives to actually take the EV ecosystem to the next level. Uh, it could it could be encouraging mm -hmm. in the form of uh, asking the societies or the, the commercial establishments to ensure that the public charging stations are there or the charging stations are available all across the uh, mm -hmm. locations. And those are the kind of things that are required, mm. apart from the other usual non-fiscal non incentives like uh, making it easy to uh, uh, to deal with, uh, let's say, the authorities, making it easy for uh, making it easy for the users for, mm. uh, uh, um, uh, let's say, free parking or free toll, and those kind of things which are very non-fiscal but very, very, uh, I would say, symbolic sometimes in nature. But it gives the right message to the customer. Mm. The policy intent is there, mm. the execution, some work to be done, mm. but the non-fiscal incentives mm. are something which are really, really desirable, and then we are right up there. Right. Okay, uh, can you give us once again your, your timeline for setting up 100,000 charging stations? About 2024, we are, we are in the public domain by uh, saying that. Uh, of all denominations put together, mm. uh, public charging, captive charging, mm. buses, and all of those, uh, we have, we have, we have, I mean, we had announced it in the previous uh, uh, meet as well. So that's broadly what we are planning to. But okay. this number could be lesser, or be more dependent on depending on how things move. Uh, if we are, if we are able to get to a right. much better uh, uh, migration of electric vehicle, then Tata Power is committed to really transitioning, mm. uh, making this commitment to a much higher number as well. Okay. Uh, Dr. Goenka, if I can ask you this question, what is the current cost of owning an electric vehicle? Uh, do you think it's now becoming attractive for a customer to, to, uh, to own an electric scooter or an electric car? Right now, uh, the central government does not subsidize private mobility when it comes to cars, but you are getting uh, subsidies from different state governments. Uh, do you think it's now becoming attractive to own an electric vehicle? It's cheaper now? It's getting cheaper? So before I answer that question, let me uh, first uh, compliment Tata Power uh, for taking the lead in setting up the charging infrastructure. As we have talked about many times, that uh, about the only thing that is missing uh, in, in sort of uh, damping up electric vehicles is uh, good charging infrastructure. 
Antara Para powers have done quite a bit. Uh, India hasn't yet defined clearly the charging protocol. And I think it's important that we define charging protocol, otherwise we'll end up with uh, too many different uh, charging protocols coming into the vehicles. Similarly, I'm very encouraged with uh, Ola's move uh, for a mega giga factory for two wheelers. I think the only way to crack the, the cost, the pricing uh, equation is to have a very large scale plant. And that's what Ola is doing. And if Ola succeeds in what they have uh, just said, and I, have, I see no reason why they will not, I think it will be a, a game changer mm. uh, for at least two wheelers uh, in terms of how two wheelers will become very affordable and therefore uh, take off uh, fairly quickly mm. uh, and get in penetration of electric vehicles. Mm. Now, coming to your specific questions, uh, question, uh, see, it depends on who you talk to and which segment you're talking about. Uh, let me uh, take the easiest mm. one first, which is three wheelers. Uh, in three wheeler segment, even without the state government incentive like what Gujarat has announced, uh, owning and operating electric three wheeler mm. is lower cost per kilometer uh, than owning and operating uh, any other mm. IC engine three wheeler. Uh, and frankly, I see no reason today mm. uh, why uh, three wheeler penetration should not be much higher than what it is today. Even charging is not an issue there. Mm. Uh, getting 100 uh, kilometer plus mm. range uh, is what. Uh, the three wheelers are providing mm. and that is sufficient for an operator to operate for a day. Uh, so therefore, uh, my, my first mm. thing would be uh, to more or less convert the whole fleet of three wheelers into, into electric. Now coming to cars, uh, okay. there's been some attempt to uh, to do car electric cars in shared mobility. Uh, not very successful because of cost reason and because of range. Uh, I think the costs are coming down, but they have not quite reached the level where mm. commercially it's justifiable for uh, the, the, the aggregators, the fleet operators to operate electric vehicles. I believe that the sweet spot is to have a vehicle sub 10 lakh, closer to 9 lakh, uh, giving a range uh, higher than 200 mm. kilometer for the 250 kilometer. So if you can get that 10 lakh, 250 kilometer range, then I think that will be the takeoff point for, uh, mm. for at least shared mobility and fleet operations of electric vehicles. As far as personal mobility is concerned, you are right that the government of India has not given the sort of uh, benefit for private mobility and that's because that was not the intent. The intent was, as I have said all along, mm. uh, that we should make shared mobility mm. and commercial applications of electric vehicles uh, get going first mm. because that's where the payback will be the highest. And that's the reason the government has put their uh, mm. effort into promoting shared mobility. Uh, and I think in private mobility, uh, right. the, the, the kind of products that we have today, which are doing reasonably okay, setting so about 500, 700 uh, uh, per mm. month kind of number. Uh, but clearly that doesn't really define a takeoff. Okay. So I again go back that we need to have the 10 lakh, 250 kilometer or sub 10 lakh uh, above 200 to 250 kilometer range uh, is what is needed to take off on, on this. On two wheeler, I think uh, it's still very expensive. Uh, if you look at private uh, mobility, in spite of frame benefit, in spite mm. of uh, uh, the, the uh, GST being lower, uh, I think uh, the cost of a scooter, uh, mm. I think it's in the order of a lakh, uh, mm. where the IC engine is about 55, 60,000, mm. 65,000. Uh, that's too much of a difference. Uh, and again, right. I go back to what Ola is doing. If, if they do a plant to produce 2 million, 3 million vehicles uh, and do uh, uh, vertical mm. integration, then I think they can probably reach a point where the electric two-wheeler uh, would be maybe just marginally more mm. uh, than than uh, IC engine two wheel, and that's again when it will take off. Uh, I think consumers will begin to like electric two wheel. Right. It's only the cost that is uh, coming in the way of doing that, uh, and and the pickup again is very slow. We okay. probably sold about a lakh, lakh and a half uh, two wheelers last year, uh, which is which is nothing compared to the overall size of the industry. Okay. So so it really comes down to three right. uh, getting the cost and range right which is the role of the OEMs, right. which will require scale. Getting the charging mm -hmm. infrastructure uh, spread out, which is the role of uh, mm -hmm. people like Tata Power. Mm -hmm. And uh, getting the vehicles mm -hmm. on the road, which is in effect the role of uh, people like Ola, uh, who need to do more and more of electric vehicles, right. not just two-wheeler, but three and four-wheelers also in their fleet. And once we start seeing okay. in the fleet, then I think vehicles will take off. So, a uh, little bit of a longer answer to your right. question, but, uh, but again, I'm saying that everything that has to be done now has to be done by the OEMs, by the uh, aggregators, fleet operators, uh, service providers, and by the charging infrastructure okay. uh, companies that are setting up charging infrastructure. 
All right. So a lot has to be now done by OEMs and service providers. Arun Kumar, coming to you once again. Uh, Dr. Goenka raised a very important point that an EV scooter still needs to be more exp more cheaper. Uh, it has to be around 65,000. Currently, it's around 1 lakh. After all the revised fame incentives and the state government subsidies, you are going to be building on scale. You're looking at uh, manufacturing 10 10 million electric vehicles per year by the end of 2022. So can we anticipate uh, a more competitive pricing by Ola Electric? If an average electric scooter in the market today is for about 1 lakh, 1 lakh 10,000, would your scooter be in the same range or cheaper? Yeah, thanks uh, for that, uh, Parikshit. I think you should expect uh, very competitive pricing from Ola. Uh, but having said that, I obviously not in a position to reveal the exact pricing and we will have a slew of models which should cater to the various data of the uh, consumer buy. Now having said that, uh, two very important things. One, it's very important to educate the customer on the cost of the vehicle from a complete ownership perspective over its life. As I say, cost of life ownership. And uh, studies say that a typical mm -hmm. ice costs about 2,600 to 2,700 dollars for a five-year life and uh, we will educate the customers and you'd see the quality of a product coming out that uh, over the life of the vehicle over five years it's going to cost the customer less than two thousand dollars so that's really the key about uh, an electric vehicle it's not just about the day one pricing mm. it's about the cost of mm. maintaining that vehicle over a five-year period the second thing that we are doing and, and right. maybe uh, it could be the second reason to sort of earn a compliment from Dr. Pavan is that we are also investing in a charging network. About, uh, if you look at February 2021 release, um, our, our, mm. our founder, Mr. Bavish, had come public that uh, we have committed $2 mm. billion dollars investment to set up 100,000 charging points across this country in the next four to five years, mm. which will make it the densest network mm. in the world. So the anxiety is something that will go away. Mm. And the third thing, uh, again, not mm. to get um, focused on price alone is, is a function of uh, functionality that comes with price, uh, is that our range, mm. the product will be superior enough to offer mm. the range to the customer, including not compromising on acceleration, pickup, and several other digital features that's going to warp the customer, that uh, uh, the adoption will be faster mm. simply because the range is going to be higher. Uh, and that's also made possible because uh, okay, we've done a lot of first principles thinking and we have localized a lot of technology right. and uh, property technology that Ola has brought in in its future factory. Right. So, Arun, very quickly, very briefly, can can I assume that when you're saying that you'll be a competitive price, it will be the cheapest EV in the market and higher range than other electric vehicles, other electric two-wheelers? Is that what you're As claiming? I said, um, as I said, we will come out with a bouquet of offerings to suit the various uh, price okay. points and uh, it will be connected with the right. kind of frills or the capabilities of the bike, including the power. And uh, we certainly will be quite competitive okay. and that's what the Future Factory is uh, meant for. All right. I'm going to take some quick questions now. We're coming to the end of our show with uh, Mr. Bangya and Dr. Pavan Goenka. Mr. Bangya, just to come to you on the charging point again. Uh, Battery swapping versus conventional charging infrastructure. Do you, do you, would you like the government to come up with a long-term roadmap on how many EVs would it like to see on the roads by 2025 uh, or by 2030? A mandated roadmap on charging infrastructure as well and clarity on how many battery swapping stations there should be, how many conventional charging stations there should be? Well, I think... Uh, uh the government's role is to facilitate the facilitate the things and make it easy for the uh, private entrepreneurs or the public organizations or large institutions like ours to make it work for uh, for the ecosystem. And this is why I, this is where I always say uh, that you know the charging infrastructure largely is uh, is, is comprising of three C's. Three C's: uh, the consistency. In fact, uh, Dr. Pawan Goenka referred to this one: the consistency of the connector. Uh, the consistency in the policies. So while uh, all state policies, 18 state policies have been announced, there is a fair amount of difference between states policies, policy number A and policy number B. But having said that, all of them are fantastic. Mm. But there could be a good amount of consistency. Uh, 
this is this is the consistency mm-hmm. part of it collaboration is very very critical uh, we people like us charge point mm-hmm. operators have to collaborate with oems the manufacturers uh, like ola like um, mahindra and mahindra like tata motors mm-hmm. like all the other so to to understand and exchange information and we have got some of those tie ups in place where we feed a lot of information back to the right. oems and oems feed a lot of information to us so this is a collaboration bit and collaboration does not okay. end with oems and government and it, it it has to go to the state uh, it has to go to the you know city authorities it has to go to the uh, you know uh, private private uh, enterprises and then finally the customer experience so right. these are the three things that really comprise the charging infrastructure i really don't think that uh, the government needs to mandate that you need x amount of chargers in this city and all of that it, it's something okay. that the ecosystem builds uh, for itself the charging plus the oem right. that's the way they work all know. right Okay, we've completely run out of time, but uh, Dr. Goenka, thank you very much for joining us here on CNBC TV Teen. Uh, Sandeep Bangya, GR Arun Kumar, it was a pleasure having all of you here, giving us a sense of how India's EV story is going to proceed over the next five to ten years. Lots of excitement on the electric vehicle space in India. Keep watching CNBC TV Teen for more news and updates.